All right. Hey, everyone. Hopefully, you can uh, see and hear me. Um, I'm going to try to share the screen here. All right. So thanks very much for this opportunity to, to speak uh, at this first ever Analog Astronaut Conference. It's a very cool opportunity. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about uh, Earth analogs for space, uh, Moon, and Mars. And um, my work in each of these sectors. So for space, uh, that's NASA HERA, the Human Exploration Research Analog. Uh, the Moon, my work with Project Possum. Um, and then Mars is my work with my own uh, citizen science initiative called Mars. I just want to check, is everything working okay? Hopefully you can. Uh... Yep. Great. Okay. Great. So yeah, I wanted to kind of start with uh, where it all began for me. Um, so back in 2008, I was doing my master's research. Um, I didn't have a location yet. Um, and then I got some grant money and decided that Iceland would be a really great place. Um, it's volcanic, you know, it's got all this basaltic rock, it's got glaciers and ice caps. Um, and the more I dug into it, I found out that this is also uh, where the Apollo astronauts did a lot of their training up here in, in Northern Iceland. So this is called the Vatnajökull ice cap. It's the largest ice cap uh, in Europe. And then just north of here, you get a lot of runoff uh, from the ice. And so it actually can weather uh, a lot of these rocks. Um, and it has great analog potential, not just for the moon, but also Mars. Uh, so here's an image uh, that I pulled from the Exploration Museum that's based up north in Husavik, uh, Iceland. They have a great museum there that documents all this history. And so the Apollo astronauts who are up there training in a place called Askia uh, to get ready for their moon missions to really get that hands-on experience. And you can see here in the foreground what those rocks look like, um, all volcanic rock. How do we actually explore this in an environment uh, on Earth first before committing to other places like the moon and Mars? So for my own research, um, I went a little bit further north. You can even just tell from the landscape looks very um, moon or, or, or Mars-like aside from the plants uh, every now and then. But this was for my master's research, and I was really interested in learning about what kinds of weathering were happening um, on these volcanic rocks, because satellites um, in orbit around, um, around Mars have been seeing some very interesting results. Um, on the surface of these rocks, uh, they were seeing evidence for a lot of water interaction with the rocks, but another orbiter that was measuring the chemistry with depth was not seeing this. And so it's like, what, what is this disconnect here? And can we go to a place in the field where we can actually test uh, some of this? And so my work was called Spectral and Chemical Variations in Rocks and Soils from Iceland's Interior. So we're trying to understand these weathering processes in Mars because the northern part of Mars is believed that there could have been a very large uh, ocean there. And so is that actually true? Was there, was there a longstanding kind of deep, deep ocean or is this kind of just water that would come and go? What about the ice from the ice caps? And so this contraption here was actually built by my colleague, uh, Patrick Rowe. And so it's called a core. So, but you can see this tube here and it can collect samples with depth. So again, we can collect all the soil and uh, rock we want from the surface. But really what we want to understand is more with depth, just down to like the first couple feet uh, of what the chemistry and mineralogy is doing. Again, because if the mineralogy on the surface is saying one story, what is the story below the surface? Did water actually reach a lot further down, creating you know, this kind of ocean environment? Or is it just random water here and there in Mars's past? And so for example, uh, we're using what's called a spectroscopy. And so you could think about it as a fingerprint that every rock and every mineral has its own unique fingerprint. And you can tell by absorptions and reflections uh, what mineralogy um, is in there. And so, for example, in this red um, curve here, this is the interior of the rock. It's got a classic W shape, which means it's not really altered. It's normal like volcanic rock. But on the surface of that rock, uh, we have this green curve here, which has this V shape, which means this is actually water is causing these kinds of um, differences in mineralogy. And so using this kind of information um, and using 
uh, chemical data from these cores below, we were actually able to find out that, yeah, indeed, we really do need boots on the ground, uh, aside from you know the rovers and the landers on Mars, to really understand um, this chemistry more, more in depth. So that's kind of what started me on the path of really just being in love with uh, planetary field geology. Um, but I wanted to talk also about um, my experience with NASA HERA. This was a really unique opportunity to spend a month in a habitat at the Johnson Space Center. And so this is my team here. Uh, and this is a, a patch that we came up with because every team uh, comes up with their own, uh, own design. And uh, HERA 12, we were the last campaign um, for that year. And so we lived in this little habitat here. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour uh, here shortly. Um, and for about 30 days um, and 650 square feet. I mean, we've all been going through this pandemic. You know, at least we have the opportunity oftentimes to get outside, but we couldn't leave. You know, if we leave, that's simulated space out there if you go out the airlock. So it was really an interesting uh, psychological uh, experiment for me. Like I spend a lot of time um, outdoors uh, and, and climbing, sometimes confined to tents, uh, but this is a very, very different experience for me. And so again, HERA stands for Human Exploration Research Analog, a closed habitat, uh, three stories. Um, and this is us in the lift all together during the countdown. And then that's us after when we finally got out. So what is the purpose behind this one? So NASA was simulating a mission to an asteroid. So the 30 day mission was actually compressed from about over 700 days of an actual mission to an asteroid in the asteroid belt. Um, and so throughout September and October of 2016, it ended up being seven weeks total because you spend two weeks ahead of time uh, preparing for the mission, learning everything you need to learn. It's also kind of that quarantine period to see if anyone gets sick. Um, and then you have 30 days in the mission and then another week of debriefs uh, afterwards. And so while Mars attracts our attention, asteroids demand it, right? If there's a threat to the Earth, we really want to know about it. So this kind of of simulation is actually uh, quite valid because we might have to someday um, go to the to the asteroids as well as for for mining purposes or resources in outer space as we expand out from Earth. And so the science behind it was more so testing the effects of stress, uh, stress and isolation, uh, both on physical and mental health. So what is it like when you put four people together who don't know each other, who are learning to be a team into a high intensity kind of environment of you know, not, not um, disasters happening on board um, the spaceship, things like that. So how they captured that mission realism was the launch and landing details where the floorboards are shaking and you really feel like you're going for a launch. Um, astronaut wake up music like they do on the International Space Station. Each of us had our choices with music. It's a really cool thing to wake up to. Um, a leftover food from the International Space Station uh, as well. So we're actually able to sample a lot of that food. Uh, but also new foods that they were testing uh, for long duration missions to see, well, is this food going to be boring after a while or is it still going to be tasty? So they're doing all sorts of interesting um, tests with food as well. And then once we actually got to the asteroid and had our rendezvous, there were comm delays that were meant to simulate. Like if we have a problem, we call it into mission control, but it's up to us to solve it because five minutes later we'll get a response and hopefully we made the right choice. Um, so mission emergencies varied uh, from fires to punctures, things like that, that we had to solve uh, as a team, learning everything we had learned along the way. Um, the actual asteroid rendezvous was only three days out of that 30 day mission. So the whole time you're spending prepping for it, then you have those final kind of three days of rendezvous and then just the journey back. Um, so there's a lot that happens uh, meanwhile. So a quick tour of what this looks like, we took some panos here. So level one is called the lab. And so we did things with microbiology, uh, biology, botany, and geology. Um, so here you can see a glove box where we would uh, collect samples from the asteroid. Obviously this is done in virtual reality, but then magically a box appeared of samples we had collected and then we were able to study them uh, in that glove box there. And then up on the second level was the galley and the gym. So this is where we'd all hang out uh, to have our meals. And then um, we had a kitchen, very tiny uh, behind this uh, table here that pops up. And then a gym because every day we did 30 days, or sorry, every day we did 30 minutes of some kind of exercise, uh, which include uh, weights or an exercise bicycle 
And then you see this ladder up here that leads to the, uh, the third floor, which is really just tiny sleeping quarters and everyone gets a section uh, of the habitat. And then this is the ladder or the lift that connects uh, level one and level two. Um, so we could climb the ladder as often as we wanted. I did this a lot for exercise, but then when we were during a sleep deprivation phase, we had to use it as a lift instead. So this could actually move up as a lift as well. And so this is our journey. Once we uh, took off from earth, here's us going past the moon. And I point out this camera here because there's and a microphone. So there's cameras and microphones strewn about in the entire habitat, except obviously the hygiene module, bathroom, um, and the private sleeping quarters. And then we're also wearing headsets with microphones uh, so they can listen to our conversations. We are also wearing um, instruments that would show proximity, like how close we'd get to someone, if someone's having a confrontation or what's happening. Um, so I called it NASA Big Brother. They're there watching everything. And so in the beginning, that's a little strange, um, but then you just kind of get used to it. You kind of go about with what you have to do and don't care about those cameras and microphones. So a little bit about what life was like in the HAB. So I mentioned that the meals um, were left over from the International Space Station. You can see this little blue tab here, that's a Velcro. So they actually would Velcro that you know, out in space. Um, and then here's where we put in the syringes and really just reheat this food with hot water. And it was surprisingly tasty and oftentimes a bit too spicy, but which makes sense when astronauts are actually up in space and all the fluid build up uh, in their faces, they don't taste as well. And so they have to make these things quite flavorful. And this is me going up and down the ladder. So two months after um, doing this NASA mission, I was uh, leading an expedition to Aconcagua. So that's the highest peak in South America, almost 23,000 feet. And here we are at sea level, stuck in this habitat, going a little stir crazy after, after just a week or so. And so I just took it upon myself to climb up and down that ladder as much as I could, uh, trying to set like a, uh, a height goal. Um, but it's just, you have to do things like that to keep it interesting. And again, with the pandemic that we've all been experiencing, I'm sure we've all found ways um, to deal with this as well. So from the physical and psychological uh, point of view. Uh, this is a, a picture also showing what those sleeping quarters are like. So when you unzip this, there's a little closet um, where you put your clothing and then a nice little mattress and that's all you needed. And so we would get anywhere from six to eight hours of sleep, depending on what, what was going on for the day. And then they did put us through a sleep deprivation uh, experiment, which lasted almost 40 hours. Brutal just to be up and doing tasks that entire time because they were testing our cognitive abilities, our abilities to do the simulations with flight, things like that. Taking samples also, uh, blood, saliva, to understand uh, what those stress markers were in each of us. So not being a biologist myself and not knowing much about it, I found that part of the study really fascinating. So like, what is my body doing when it's going through this type of stress? I've put it through stress when I climb mountains, but this is a little different, well, a lot different. And then some of the mission tasks that we did, we would build a rover. So from scratch uh, with very minimal instructions. And so we had to tap into a mission control to help us with that. And then we had a, our own little Wally there at the end, which is cool. And then here's a picture of one of my colleagues working uh, with a sample uh, in the glove box. So everything has to be done, all those measurements from within that glove box, which could be pretty challenging. Um, and as a geologist, I have my PhD uh, in geological sciences. Uh, I was the one who was kind of helping guide um, how this analysis was done for the purposes of our mission. Maintenance, things are always breaking down uh, every day. We'd have something we would, we would have to be fixing. So here we have our iPads, we'd follow the instructions and fix stuff. And then if you can see, just make it out there, I'm wearing these two proximity um, and voice um, instruments as that other scientists were using to study us when we were in, uh, in the hab. And then hydroponics. Uh, so this is us attempting to, uh, to grow plants. Uh, only one of them actually took of our, of our three experiments there. Um, but just really cool little tasks that we, would, uh, that we would do. And then just seeing a bit of greenery, you know, in this habitat that we grew is kind of a cool thing also uh, psychologically. And then just a picture here for the virtual reality. So he was a mission specialist. So he would wear the virtual reality goggles and go to the surface of the asteroid for missions. And meanwhile, myself and the flight engineer would be navigating our virtual reality 
astronauts to the surface and you can see big rocks here. So we'd go to this grid, for example, and we have things we have to do, pick up this rock, collect the core, very similar to what I was actually doing uh, in Iceland, but obviously here in virtual reality. And so my job as the commander um, of this mission was to, be, to fly, to fly the astronauts there and guide. And this just gives an uh, example of all the different screens I had to manage, the communications, uh, what our little uh, spacecraft is doing, the surface, and then you can see these tubular looking things. These are paths that the astronauts on the ground had to follow to get to sample locations. So very, very involved, lots of communication needed. And then you have this camera watching you right here, uh, watching your face. Um, and you can see his watch here, monitoring a uh, heart rate to see when uh, they throw some uh, curveballs at you, what happens. So all in all, this is a really interesting um, experiment. And it got me really interested in, in pursuing this more, but in the outdoor realm, more of what I know. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about Project Possum. So my colleague and the founder of Project Possum, Dr. Jason Reimuller, will be on later uh, on a panel. Um, so I don't want to steal his thunder here, but just what is Project Possum? It uh, stands for Polar Suborbital Science in the Upper Mesosphere. Uh, so this is a part of the atmosphere that has been historically ignored. So its name is also the Ignorosphere. But it turns out uh, that this upper edge of our our atmosphere on the edge of space is actually quite important. We see climate change manifesting on the surface. You know, I am a specialist in, in how glaciers are melting. I climb mountains to study this stuff. But in our troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, there's changes occurring that are showing that yes, indeed, um, all the burning of fossil fuels is really manifesting in, in the layers of the atmosphere and they're affecting them differently. And so with possum, it's studying this upper meso mesosphere, uh, the formation of what's called these uh, electric blue noctilucent clouds. And the only way you can get up there to study them is through suborbital flight. And so Jason has set up this amazing citizen scientist astronaut program. Uh, so here I am in a, a spacesuit that was designed by Final Frontier Design, it's based out of New York City. And I'm in one of these simulators. I'm running a camera here and simulating collecting samples once we hit suborbital flight. So the beauty of Project Possum is that it's training you about all the kinds of things, the kind of science you would do um, on one of these missions, but at its heart is also about the citizen science, that anyone can come and learn how to do this if they have the passion passion for it. So after um, I went through this, this program, I was invited to co-teach <clears throat> a new class. So here's Jason myself and Jose Hurtado is the co-instructor for this class called Planetary Field Geology um, and he actually has been responsible for training a lot of the new astronaut groups in NASA um, at the San Francisco Volcanic Field so it's an area in Arizona that again has been used in the past um, to simulate lunar terrain and the kinds of experiments that can be done to prep so there's this cone here in the background and in the next shot I'll show you we actually went and climbed up this thing and walked around the rim. And the idea behind this is, so there's a webinar that happens four months ahead of time where students learn about uh, the moon and Mars as well, and then develop their own tool. So an exploration tool that they would actually uh, prototype and then bring out to the field and actually put it into action to see how they could actually understand this geologic landscape better. Uh, some people come with background <coughs> uh, in geology but it's not necessary. You know, we teach you along the way. And this is an example of one of these tools that was built. And so people are studying anything from how to actually collect samples. If you're wearing astronaut gloves, for example, and they're kind of bulky, how do you actually collect samples? Uh, this one is about understanding more about uh, what the seismic information is telling you underground. Um, rock hardness, things um, that have been done in the past in the moon to see how it works in this environment from their own tools but also just brand new ideas. So this is a really cool playground for us to really have students explore um, what's possible out there. Uh, and then I brought along what's called this halo. And so the halo is this, it's basically like this tool out of Star Trek. It's something that I dreamed about having when I was a student um, because you take this instrument and you point it on a rock and it can actually tell you what minerals are present on the surface of the rock. So if you remember back to when I talked about Iceland, my master's research was looking at these kinds of coatings and weathering products 
and the volcanic rocks as well as with soils. But I had to kind of figure it all out in the lab afterwards. And so this instrument allows you to do it in situ. So this is my contribution to the classes I brought um, along this instrument. It was um, for rent by a very generous company. And to give you an idea, once you put it down onto the surface of a rock, then it tells you all the different mineralogy. Now, as a geologist, like I didn't even recognize some of these things. So, so you do have to do some uh, ground truthing of this and, and try to understand what uh, kinds of minerals may be present. But all these are called alteration minerals. The significance of that is that oftentimes there is a contribution of water, water interacting with that volcanic rock that's giving you a signature. And so for moon and Mars missions where, where we're looking for, hey, is there any presence of of water, what kind of a weathering happened, uh, what's the uh, climate history, then this kind of tool can help you actually understand and decipher that information. So students really enjoyed uh, working with this and actually learning from this, this tool. So moving on then to science in the wild in my last few minutes here. Um, so I took a group to the Atacama Desert in Chile. That's another place where NASA has done tests uh, with rovers for Mars missions. Uh, Science in the Wild is a company I started after finishing my PhD. So I spent a year abroad uh, in Nepal. And along the way, I had so many people ask me questions about what I am doing on these glaciers or up in the mountains, I'm carrying equipment. Um, and so, oh, sorry. So I came up with this idea to come up with an adventure science expedition company that's immersive and educational. And so the manifestation of that was uh, one in Chile, Ojos del Salado one of the highest volcanoes and it has microbial activity um, at the summit there. And then we had a patch design here. You guys may know from the space community, Tim Gagnon produces beautiful kinds of patches. Um, and so this actually we still have for sale if anyone might be interested in it. But it documents all the people that come on this citizen science expedition to do a Mars analog type trip. So just to orient us, again, we can see how it looks pretty Martian here. We're here, we're in the northern part of Chile. Um, really remote, it takes quite a while to get up there. And we're camping and we're going at high altitude. So this is definitely a, um, a Mars analog trip that is quite involved because you're not in a habitat, you're not in, a, in, a, in any kind of laboratory, you're actually out in the field doing this. And so I provide you with a science guidebook here called a mission log about what you're gonna be doing, what's the itinerary um, what are you gonna be doing every day? And then what kind of toolbox you have available? We have rock hammers, we have weather stations, we have pH paper, we have spectrometers, um, thermal infrared cameras, all these kinds of things that you can use out in the field. But I don't tell you necessarily how to use it because when you arrive on one of these trips, uh, you get a role. So this one in particular was a mission specialist and they were gonna be a hydrologist. So these are all the different uh, things they were responsible for, water quality testing, water snow gathering, things like this. So you get a role uh, and you also have to collaborate with other people in this analog to understand like the major overarching question, which is um, revealed to you once you're on one of these expeditions. And you get this uh, field notebook where you, you learn how to take notes as a field uh, scientist as well. So really it's about learning you know about the, the science but also learning to work as a team in a one of these kinds of extreme environments and so this is at around eight thousand feet we're making our way eventually we made it up to twenty thousand feet um, on this expedition but we're exploring the desert here so you can see where water used to run and so um, students would be doing um, experiments and making measurements all along the path here we provide soil testing kits and we'd also be doing spectroscopy with a different, little bit different tool than what I showed you that we use with Project Possum. Um, so we, we do introduce a variety of kinds of tools to teach uh, people on these trips, the kinds of different tools scientists use to come up with answers. Uh, so to give you an idea, we would create these Martian field grids in the Atacama Desert. AOIs, areas of interest, we would choose, we would block them off and then we would explore them. Geologically, I would teach what kinds of uh, measurements field geologists actually make chemical and biological, what kinds of tests we can do for the nutrients uh, in the soil. And then the spectroscopic, kind of putting it all together. After you look at the rocks, after you make some measurements of the soils, now 
what does the spectroscopy say about, well, was there any kind of water here? What kind of potential for habitability? Uh, is there? It was kind of the, the big picture idea. And so this is at work in the field here. So you see how we chose this, this area and landscape. We, we walk out a grid and then we all gather together to make some measurements. We flag interesting rocks. We make actual measurements in situ there. And then we do a lab analysis. There's a hut, for example, um, along the, the trail here. We're actually making measurements. This has um, this instrument has its own light source, so we don't need to rely on the sun for some of the measurements, which I've had issues with in the past. But you can see that these volcanic rocks have interesting uh, coatings on them, again, indicative of past water interaction, and that's what we are looking at. So again, on these types of trips, you have a role, but you're also interacting with everyone, and you're also learning a lot of science along the way in situ. And one of the last days we were up there, we, for, the, for those who have seen the Martian movie and the sandstorm, we had a pretty incredible one where just all this fine stuff just getting tossed and our, our tents were just coated uh, in dust. And so it just kind of gave us a feel for the, ex um, the extreme environment that we are working in. You know, imagine doing science, you know, just, just outside here, uh, wherever you live, but then imagine doing it at 10,000, 14,000, 20,000 feet. It definitely gets intense. So even though we might not have um, a true Mars environment, we definitely have an extreme environment where you do have less oxygen uh, and you are working hard at altitude uh, to try to do the science. <coughs> this is a picture of my wonderful team. And then just to end up here on the future, what are we looking at? Obviously with the pandemic, um, things have been on hiatus. Everything has been kind of in the virtual space. But we're thinking about Kilimanjaro uh, from the science perspective, I'm taking a few uh, groups up on the north side, but the south side provides some very interesting Mars analog. You can already see here, there's some interesting yellow coatings. Um, there's a lot of sulfur, obviously. Kilimanjaro is a dormant volcano. Um, but this is called the Alpine Desert of Kilimanjaro, which has some really interesting uh, mineralogy. And so we have uh, a plan for a future science in the wild Mars analog trip to Kilimanjaro. And so this is an example of what one of those rocks looks like. Here's the interior this beautiful basaltic rock, and then you have this really interesting thick layer. What is this? And that's something you find out on one of these trips. And if you're interested in joining, I put the, uh, the web page down here. These um, new trips, the Mars analog ones, there is a Mars, there's an analog section on scienceinthewild.com, but the trips that are in the works right now have not actually gone live yet, so we put the final touches on it. Again, based on the pandemic, it's been kind of hard to plan. But do reach out uh, if you're interested in taking part in this. And I think we have, Yes, five minutes for questions. Stop sharing. All right. And yes, we, we have questions here. <laughs> Okay, so I see Osho, Priya. How can the data collected and results found, especially for the impact of isolation on mental health, help people currently in the pandemic? Very, very excellent question. So I know that there's a couple um, publications that have come out uh, from NASA HERA, and I can get you links to those. Um, and I think the most important thing that I learned from that experience is always trying to, to have some task to kind of keep busy. So the iPads that they had us using um, was, it was kind of the same as with the International Space Station astronauts where we were chased what's called the red line. The red line's going, you have all these tasks you gotta meet, you gotta beat that red line. And so I kind of found myself using that a little bit during the pandemic to be like, all right, you know, I can't go out, for example, when we were in lockdown, but I can keep myself busy with tasks. I can learn a new skill, a new hobby. Um, but obviously this was 30 days versus a year uh, ongoing now with this pandemic. Um, but yeah, I will definitely look into um, getting you a link to one of those papers. How would you recommend people from other disciplines, astrophysics in my case, getting more involved in skilled in geosciences? Ah, yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of information out there you can find um, online, uh, general kind of intro geology. But in fact, I've been developing these kinds of, of courses with Science in the Wild Academy. 
So feel free to reach out um, to me if you're interested in, um, in learning specifics as far as analog um, geoscience. Um, and I'm also working on a series of, of videos towards this end uh, as well. As far as getting involved, uh, definitely just reach out, um, connect with me on, on social media, um, and then a LinkedIn, any, any, whatever you find is the easiest way to connect, signsinthewild.com, we have a contact uh, form there. So what do we do with all the data? So right now, a lot of data is in um, a data repository that's being worked on for publications. So some of it has not been made public yet, um, but once it has been uh, published, the idea will be on the Science in the Wild webpage to create a map with all the different field locations we've been and have that data available free for use uh, for scientists who may have other uses for it. Um, and citizen scientists who do come along these trips and get um, involved in the work are put on publications. And then astrobiologists. Oh, so um, have you been working with any astrobiologists to run parallel studies of what microflora are thriving. No, that would be really amazing. In fact, uh, Ojos del Salado, um, that volcano I mentioned in Chile, um, we didn't get to the summit. It was um, almost almost 22,000 feet. You know, the weather turned on us, it was just very challenging. Um, so we still have that, we have that expedition to go back to reach the summit because we wanna collect samples um, from the vents up there actually to answer some of these astrobiology questions. And I was working with a scientist at CU Boulder, University of Colorado Boulder towards this end, but unfortunately we didn't make it that time. So that is a future expedition. Uh, if you happen to be an astrobiologist and wanna get involved, definitely reach out on that. And then let's see. How do analog astros get time away from their jobs and fund going on missions? Um, yeah, so um, in my case, I have a job where I uh, work part-time uh, teaching and then have the time off to be able to do these types um, of expeditions. But like with NASA Hera, that was actually paid. So you did get paid for that. Um, and so for funding on missions with science in the wild, um, definitely encourage reaching out there and figuring out ways that you can fundraise for it. Um, and then if you can provide, if you're a scientist uh, coming along on one of these trips, versus citizen scientists, like someone who has an actual project you want to piggyback, we, we can talk and we can offer uh, deals that way as well. I want to see if I got all the questions. I think so. And we have one more. Which one did I miss? Oh. Yeah, so so for that, um, again, it's uh, sometimes you can do, I, I've seen people do GoFundMe uh, for the Mars Desert Research Station, for example, for folks who wanna go on there and be part of a team. Um, those types of uh, analog missions are sometimes just a couple of weeks, like two weeks versus a month. So those are sometimes more doable for people with vacation time. Um, both, and I'm also trying to, for with Science in the Wild at least, I'm, I'm also uh, aware of the challenges of people getting away for a month, for example, for a climbing expedition. So trying to create more um, a smaller experiences um, as far as like a week, week and a half, two weeks that are more doable for people for work schedules. So that is definitely coming, at least in my case, with the analog stuff I'm working on, um, along with Project Possum. That EVA class that you saw, it's a um, couple months of webinars, but then it's um, it's only like five or six days in the field. So it's definitely doable as far as work schedule. And again, funding it is, is always gonna be the challenge. Um, but again, you talk to the people in charge with these, these kinds of um, analog missions. And if you're a scientist uh, who's bringing value to those, um, to those missions and expeditions, there's deals that can be worked out. And I think we have one more here. people from other disciplines getting more involved and skilled in geosciences. Really, it's it's getting hands-on experience wherever you can. Um, when I was a student, I did a bunch of field camps, like a whole series of them. Um, and so I would recommend 
if there's any opportunity that you can have to actually get out and have a hands-on experience. That's really uh, the best way to learn. There's a lot of reading you can do. Um, you can watch um, YouTube videos, you know, and, and, and see, but really the best solution is getting out there, getting your hands dirty. And that's the kinds of experiences I'm trying to provide people through Science in the Wild. We don't just do analog missions. We do climbing expeditions, more adventure type uh, expeditions, more uh, sometimes even outreach um, types for communities in Nepal. So there's a whole variety of ways you can get involved, but really the best way to do it is just to literally get your hands dirty outdoors. Yeah. Um, can you share with us your like websites where people can get involved with, with what you do? Yeah, absolutely. So do you want me to just put it in the, oh, not in the chat. Um, www.scienceinthewild.com. Yep. Yeah, is that one? And then it's just at science in the wild uh, on Instagram and Facebook. You can connect with me through there as well. Great stuff. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much.